Hello, so welcome to Looking PhD, and in response to the last video I po that we posted with some common questions about what it's like to come to Luxembourg and do your PhD, we've gotten a lot of questions in the interim. So we have a couple of videos that hopefully will answer some of your questions about what is PhD like in Luxembourg and what exactly goes into getting a PhD here. So first question is, how many years does the PhD take? Luxembourg, unlike other countries, is very strict on this. You cannot finish your PhD in less than three years, and you must finish it within four. There is a little bit of wiggle room that you have to hand your PhD thesis in within four years, and then you have a four-month grace period to defend the thesis, but there are some complications with that. The maximum length of your PhD work contract, however, is in fact four years. And notably, you cannot finish before three years. So the earliest you can defend is in the 36th month. So one of the important things to a the PhD here is what's called the CET. It's a abbreviation for, in French, Comité d'encadrement de thèse. The CET is, like the name would suggest if you speak French, the Thesis Supervisory Committee. They're there to monitor the progress of your thesis, not continuously, but periodically. They check to make sure everything's going as planned, that you're meeting your learning objectives, that you're meeting your research objectives, that you are on track to finish your PhD within the time limit. The CET con consists normally of three members, on rare occasions four, but three is the default. You'll have normally your supervisor, you'll have one other person internal to the university or to LIST, which is the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology, and then you have a third person who is external to both. So in my case, I had my master supervisor from the United States as my third CT member. I know people who have their master supervisors as third CT members. Sometimes they have people who are very well established in their field. But the CT's purpose is to monitor your progress and make sure things are going as planned. You have a total of three in-person CT meetings. The first meeting traditionally was held by the end of the 11th month, but within the first year you'll have one CET meeting, then in the second year you'll have your second meeting, and then after, and then by month 30 you have the third CET meeting. So the first two meetings in months, in year one and year two, determine if you're making sufficient progress to be allowed to continue. The outcomes of them, you'll have a short presentation and then answer questions from the CT members. There are three outcomes of the meeting. The two that you want to get are allowed to continue with no problems and a warning that you're allowed to continue but things need to change in order to have a successful next CT. And the third outcome is that they can recommend that your PhD be terminated and then goodbye. The third CT is a little different because if you need more time to go from three years to four years, you formally ask the CT to authorize an extension of up to 12 months. You can ask for six. I know some people who have asked for only six, but by default, if you ask for an extension, normally you ask for 12. The CT's final rule is that when you're ready to defend your PhD thesis, you're going to submit a preliminary version of it to them at least two months before you defend your PhD thesis. And based on that version, the CT will then request that the university administration authorize you to defend the PhD. And as a result, the three of the CT members will, with two external members, form the final jury for your PhD defense. So I've been talking about a CT, 
Now, what are the requirements to actually get your PhD? What are the requirements that the CT is going to be monitoring? Well, apart from your thesis, which you have to write, and you have to write it yourself, no ghostwriting, you need to have three publications. Of the three publications, one of them has to have you as the first author. You write the thesis. Now, a question that's come up is what's called a cumulative thesis, which is very common in North America. Cum cumulative thesis is where you take a number of your papers, you bundle them together, tie them up with string, write an extended intro, write some additional introductory elements, and poof, you have your thesis. It is allowed in Luxembourg, but it's not favored. And in order to write a cumulative thesis, you need three first author papers. So the standard is that people will write a monograph thesis with their own work. And the three papers do not have to be published, but they have to be submitted by the time you go up to, I think, request the authorization to defend. You also have to teach. Teaching here is a very important part of the PhD, and you need to teach. So if you're teaching what are called the lab classes, where you are supervising bachelor students as they perform experiments, you teach three semesters. If you are doing what are called the tutorials, or in French, TD, you only do two semesters. So either, in my case, I did three semesters of lab classes, but it's not three semesters that you're in there 10 weeks out of the year doing all the experiments. You're normally only teaching two to four labs. Sometimes you'll have multiple sections of that, but you're only, it's not a full semester commitment of teaching. You also have to have a number of credits from coursework. So coursework is a small part of the PhD here. You need 20 ECTS, which is the unit of credits, and you can obtain these credits either through what are called transferable skills classes. These are courses offered by the university on soft skills. So how do I write papers? What's good scientific practice? How do I write grant applications? Lots of Things that I know I wish I would have learned during my first bits as a PhD student in the US, but they weren't taught. I had to learn them on my own. You also have the hard classes. So, in my case, for example, I took a polymer physics class because my PhD had a very heavy polymer component. And those are the master's degree level classes that are allowed to count for credits for your degree. And I think those are all the requirements. Things are subject to change because the university's growing, it's getting bigger. But the main things are you need the thesis, you need the publications, you need the teaching, and you need the coursework. Forgot, you can also get credits by attending conferences and presenting. So actually, most of my credits are through presenting at conferences. You get more credits if you get a contributed oral presentation compared to a poster, but conference attendance does count for credits.